known as Parimuka. Uh, Every fortnight is uh, is very. Uh, I found over 44 years very strong uh, experience. I remember when I first heard the party Mauka as a newly ordained Bhikkhu, and and um, of course I was very impressed that somebody could uh, recite 227 rules in Pali. Uh, in such a short time. But in itself I found it an incredibly powerful ceremony. And I think what is a ceremony for? You know, is it is it just a, you know, a perfunctory thing that people do? Uh, you know, just out of habit or because they think it's what they used to or what they're supposed to be doing that on and on like this, but well, so it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, so this is a commitment that we all have in common, uh, as symbolized by this recitation, and, and it's all about renunciation, uh, letting go, and about, about behavior, so that our, you know, we're learning to, uh, live with, in a way that is harmless, basically non-violent, harmless, and uh, polite, and proper, and in and, and various ways, as to, from, you know, serious offenses such as violent actions or theft, and that which are disrobing offenses to more or less agreed forms of etiquette, ways of conducting ourselves or within, a, within this tradition and this structure. But also, it is a, a, a uniting event in which this uh, this sense of it, this common commitment, uh, and then over years of this of reciting this uh, before night, then it does one feels the, the kind of power in the, in just the the bonding the, the, of of a ceremony. That uh, and you begin to understand more profoundly what ceremonies, how they can be used, what their point is. In living in uh, in the UK for so many years, where uh, modern life has almost thrown out ceremony, and and it's all very much about human rights and what individuals think and feel, and uh, all kind of etiquette, good manners, is no longer particularly uh, admired, sense of duties or responsibilities to each other. It's all, uh, you know, self-proclaiming my rights and what I think. And, and uh, so this is a, a society based on these principles of individuality and freedom and, and human rights, in which uh, ceremonies, ancient customs, and that can be seen as irrelevant or something uh, no longer necessary for a modern life. <clears throat> but in my own experience <clears throat> of living within uh, this tradition, uh, then it, you know, it's uh, because one does make that commitment and when you become, when you take the Upasampada, then of course it is, you know, it's not the, coming in to negotiate your position or or to try to change it, but to to uh, you know, like memorize the, the rules of Vinaya and learn how to live within the structure. Uh, not as a you know, as a kind of uh, institutionalization, but as a way of, of limiting action and speech to where we can get uh, a per- better perspective on behavior and on how to live together uh, as a group of monks. Like in, uh, you know, it's contemplated in my life and especially in uh, living, you know, the first few years I lived only with Thai monks and so then of course I was adapting myself to completely different culture 
language and and uh, attitudes that I didn't quite understand or appreciate at the time, but uh, you know there was there was a sense of I'm here so I'm do it, you know, the way they do it. I'm not here to negotiate a special position for myself. <clears throat> And in time, and at the time, that was possible, like, uh, prop runs were relatively rare. It was in 1966, 67, and, and uh, you know, there weren't very many of us. And it seems few like a antenna down Panyavado and chair up in Udon, and I think there was one in, in Wat playing with Pasana, and, and there was one in one ball one away, things like that, and about, I think, five or six that, that I was aware of at the time, in 1966. And so, uh, and so you know, the Thai people were quite uh, welcoming in every way, you know, and eager to, to, uh, for, to please for us. And so one could kind of pull strings and manipulate conditions for one's own benefit. And the thing that I really appreciated with Lumpur Chow was that he wouldn't do that. I couldn't, you know, there's no way I could uh, manipulate him. <laughs> Nor did I want to, but uh, I, you know, I really didn't want to, to use my, my size because I, I'm much bigger than ties, and my uh, Farang qualities and so forth as ways of, uh, you know, as, as weapons or as, as attachments that that uh, I have used in the past. You know, as a layman, it's quite a manipulative character. So, in Wapapong, it was, uh, you know, merely learning how to uh, let go and surrender to it and and uh, learn how to do it uh, in the way that everybody else was doing it in, in uh, what I call at that time. Now, I'm, my generation, we were brought up to not copy and imitate others. Uh, you know, we're about asserting our unique characters, our individuality, and, uh, and I was talking with I just can't believe this morning, but I, I'll do it my way. But thanks and I'll just. <laughs> and that, that's the theme of my generation. I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> and so that, and of course, this life is, is uh, almost the, you know, I'm not doing it my way anymore. In, that, in the sense of, my, what the, you know, my personal tendencies or habits or preferences by doing it in this way, in a, in a traditional way. Now, the, the benefit of this is that one can get perspective on my way. You know, if you have, if you're, you know, if you really use the form, the denial, the structure, and all that for mindfulness, then you do get, you know, you get clear, uh, you know, insight into all the subtle uh, attitudes and perceptions that that come from this sense of me and mine. And so that's, that's what we want to see, you know, and really the aim of this life, uh, of the monastic form, as, in, as it personified in this institution, is, is not becoming. It's not about becoming anything or attaining or achieving. It's really moving towards relinquishing, you know, this attitude of, of letting go, relinquishing, surrendering. Uh, it, these words are much more useful and helpful than attaining and achieving. When I hear people talking about <coughs> attaining stream entry or arahantship or things like this, it, this, does not, this does not make sense. Uh, there is not an attainment. You can't attain that, uh, because attaining to me is always coming from desire to get something you don't have. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, like an arhatship can be, become an arhat is like maybe a PhD or something you may not have yet that you want and you hope to get uh, in the future through doing things to attain it. Where the, monast- the Buddhist monasticism is more, it's not about getting something uh, or attaining anything that you, you know, that you don't have and hoping to to achieve it in the future, but letting go of desire and ignorance and that which is, uh, you know, one can become aware of, be aware of in the present. So it's actually moving towards nothingness, towards non-self. It's like nothing at all, moving toward, you know, to total relinquishment, there's nothing left. And when there's nothing, when there's no attachment, then there's nothing. In that sense of, uh, the, the sense of a separate self and the illusions that, that come out of ignorance have been relinquished. So that there is knowing, there's still this, you know, this consciousness, knowing, awareness, but non-self, anatta, Nibbana, non-attachment. There's a, you know, you you investigate till you you fully, insightfully observe attachment. You have to really contemplate attachment before you can let go. I mean, you can hold the idea I should let go of everything, let go of desires and be hatred and delusion. That's a you know very good idea. But that's all it is. It's not about uh, letting, you know, letting go of these uh, desires through, uh, through wishing that you could, but it's through observing, uh, witnessing the suffering that comes through attachment to desire. Contemplating desire, then, like the Dunha is... Uh, it, you know, it's not something to to despise. It's to know desire as desire, and, and to see, to observe desire as an object rather than uh, be caught in the desire to get rid of desire, or uh, all the complicated ways that the the thinking mind and and conditioned attitudes out of ignorance can can operate. In the second noble truth, the Kamadana, Pawadana, Vipavadana, this gives us three categories of, uh, you know, sense, sense desires to becoming and annihilating or getting rid of. So in my own practice over the years, I just studied, I study desire, uh, you know, as, it, as I feel it in my mind, you know, wanting to get something. I don't have is like this. And it's like Bawadanha. I put that in the category of Bawadan, wanting to become something. So, you know, when, when you're meditating in order to attain or achieve, it's like this. You know, the desire to attain, to get jhanas or attain stages or achieve uh, things like it, to be the observer of this this desire to get something you think you you don't have yet, that you hope to get in the future, is like this. Now, to make this really conscious, to be, you know, not to, you know, to really appreciate desire as something to learn from. Kamandana, of course, is, is quite obvious, desire, sensual desire and, you know, what is pleasing to the senses, uh, to sight, and sound, smell, taste, touch. Uh, these are, you know, these desires are part of this realm. This is a desire realm that we're experiencing. Uh, this is a desire form. The human body is, uh, is all about desire. You know, we wouldn't be here uh, if our parents didn't have desire, 
and and this is this is a sense realm. So it's all about you know this uh, what is attractive or uh, repulsive and pleasing or unpleasing through through that we feel with the body uh, or experience through the senses and the body. So then you have noticed that this realm is a dualistic realm, and this this means that they, that it's all about uh, they have one thing having its opposite. So if you have good, then you have to have bad. You know, they they go together, right and wrong, true and false, heaven and hell, right and wrong. It's all you know the the whole stuck the whole language that we speak is based on this dualism. On, on the critical faculty developing this is this is better than that or bigger or smaller or uh, you know we have our preferences our desires and our that which we we want to hold on to and that which we want to get rid of with or there's so much desire to destroy or get rid of what we don't like I don't know how many times I've been asked over all these years, how do I get rid of anger? You know, people will ask me, how, how can I get rid of my anger? I, mean, I, I get angry and I want to get rid of it. Tell me how to do it. And so, this, you know, because the desire to get rid of anger rather than to let go of anger. This uh, anger is a kind of primal emotion, you know, it's a, it's, it, this is a realm in which anger arises. There's a lot to be angry about. And so it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, part of the package of being born as a, in a, as a mammal, as a human being in this realm is the experience, desire, greed, uh, sensual desire and anger jealousy and fear and doubt and worry and so these are you know common to us all they're not you know they're not personal problems really they are the way they are so when people ask me how do I get rid of anger they, you don't you you know anger you you recognize it you investigate you study it uh, and then you begin to see the attachment to anger. By getting attached to it means we, we are pulled into anger through speaking or acting on it, or we try to get rid of it. We try to suppress it or resist it. Both of those are extreme reactions, wanting to get rid of anger or, or being totally caught up into it lost in our angry uh, vibration. And so this, this uh, practice mindfulness then is the way that we can actually observe anger, desire, sexual des desire, and a celibate life. You know, we choose to live a, a celibate life, which means that we we give up our rights to uh, uh, intentional sexual activities. Uh, and so we, you know, this is, it's, you know, sex, sexual desires is this, you know, one of the powerful energies that we experience through the, through the body, the sexual form. So it's, you know, it's a powerful energy that we, you know, that we, relinquish the action and speech in regarding it. But in terms of the actual reality of it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's to be understood, to be seen in terms of it is the way it is. And then our celibate uh, lifestyle is one that helps us to get that kind of perspective on the sexual energies or impulses or uh, conditions that we experience through this form. And not to see it in terms of, in so much, in such personal terms as my sexual problems or my 
the, you know, my, my sex drive and what, the way we, we claim it and, and judge ourselves according uh, to cultural attitudes or religious attitudes we have about uh, sexuality or anger, hatred, jealousy. Jealousy is another one, isn't it? It is a very powerful primal emotion. Uh, and that's part of the package. And uh, in my own, you know, I, when I started, when I became a monk, then, you know, jealousy was an emotion I didn't like at all. You know, so I really hated myself when I felt jealousy arising. Because my ideal self is that I wasn't jealous. This is what, how I wanted to perceive myself as someone who was not jealous. And so then when this particular emotion arose, then I, I re- tried to get rid of it or deny it or or sometimes just feel helplessly trapped in 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 a emotion that I didn't like and didn't want. You know then you know, ask people, what do you do with jealousy? Spread mudita. Mudita is the cure for jealousy. So I I couldn't do that either. <laughs> I couldn't pretend I was glad to somebody when I was actually jealous of them. So <laughs> I felt frustrated with this. And then then it dawned on me that jealousy wasn't the problem. It was the uh, aversion to it. It was like Vipavadana. That actually jealousy is, wasn't really so much of a problem as this uh, wanting to get rid of it. And identify, claiming it then is I shouldn't feel this, this is bad, I'm bad for feeling this emotion, how do I get rid of it? And and, uh, on and on in that way. That was the, I put that under the category of Ripple Madanha, wanting to get rid of it, resist it, suppress it, deny it. Once I saw that, that that resistance and aversion I had to the emotion, actually the emotion itself wasn't wasn't very much of a problem. So these are, you know, notice how complicated we become. Uh, it, because like in, in the Western world, we're very idealistic. And when we become monks, we, we come with very high-minded ideas about, you know, being a really good Buddhist monk and being compassionate, metta and karuna and and pure and good and and so forth and then we uh, you know we measure our own self with the ideals that we have of what a, a really good bhikkhu should be or maybe you compare yourself maybe you do kuba ajahn who are great teachers and they say they're the great pure souls and I'm just this this kind of wretched monk who so far away from purity. And so we, you know, then we, we see ourselves always in terms of what's wrong uh, compared to the projections we have towards others or the ideal of perfection that we hold. Now the only way one can ever really get this into perspective is to observe it, you know. So this, this, uh, these three kinds of desires Gamadana, Bhavadana, Vipavadana are found very skillful categories to you, you know, just for investigating my own character tendencies and habits. Then, of course, the, the, uh, I know that, you know, that in, uh, living in the Thai monastery, for example, uh, in, you know, with, uh, at Wapak home, before Westerners started coming, you know, they, the, the Thai monks, the Isan monks that I lived with, they were all, you know, from the farms around, you know, from rice farming families, and, and they, and they were brought up in Buddhist uh, culture, so they had a kind of, uh, 
kind of cultural acceptance of their human failings. You know, they didn't suffer, I didn't think they suffered like I did because uh, I couldn't, you know, my culture was based on how things should be, on ideals, not on the way things are, and not really knowing myself or what it is to be a human male in the present moment, you know, but coming always from the idea that I'm I have to work on myself to get something, to get rid of these bad habits and to develop good ones in order to become something better in the future. So this this way of reflecting, you know, and then the, the attitude of mindfulness, puto, being aware of desire. And then you contemplate that which is aware of desire, the ability to observe it, to feel it, you know, you can actually, you know, you determine to really, you know, investigate this wanting to get something or get rid of something. You can, you begin to notice it as a aramana or an object in the mind, in consciousness. No. And that which is aware of desire, puto, is not desire. And so you begin to discern pure subjectivity, awareness, and then the desires that come and go in, in our conscious moments are like this. So that means you, you're actually taking refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, aware of desire, of suffering, of the causes, of the end of suffering, of, uh, of the path of non-suffering, the eightfold path. And the more you, you kind of investigate, then, you know, it begins to, you know, you begin to really know this in a on a, in a profound way. It's no longer just me struggling with trying to, to get my practice together, but it, it's actually, you know, a powerful uh, move, movement away from uh, attachment out of ignorance. You see, you, you know the reality of attachment is always going to be suffering. And it's not attachment in itself, it's attachment out of ignorance. Avicca, bhajaya sankara, sankara bhajaya vinyana. And then it goes into suffering, you know. So as long as avicca or ignorance of Dhamma is the motivating force for our practice, for our monastic life, then this life is always going to end up as dukkha. You know, it, it, you know, this, this form is, is in itself is for reflection, not for attachment. So, you know, this of this, this emphasis on awareness, on mindfulness, is you know, this is a very. Uh, this is unique, I think, in, in the realm of religion in the world. You know, the, the emphasis the Buddha placed on Satisampachanya and Satipanya. And it's, uh, you know, you don't, no other religion puts such an emphasis on this, on this point. at least in, in such a direct and clear way as you find in this tradition, in the Theravada tradition. And in the, the sutta, the, the basic, the, the, the Tamajaka Pawatana Sutta, the first sermon, is this is the point of it. Awakened attention. And then that is the, the gate or the, the, the escape hatch from the world of ignorance and birth and death and suffering. 
So, you know, this is, how, how do we escape? When they say, what is the escape from suffering? Is it through suppressing everything we don't like? Is it through controlling the conditioned realm? You know, trying to control everything around us so that nothing unpleasant ever impinges on us or nothing, you know, we're all, everything's beautiful and, and melodic and fragrant. I mean, that we can imagine, you know, a heavenly realm where everything is, is beautiful and, and wonderful. But this realm is like this, isn't it? This human realm, planetary life, is not heaven, not heavenly realm. If you're having a body, it's like this, you know, having a male body, you know, having the male karma is, is you know, with this strong sexual drive uh, is like this, you know, it's awareness of, of, if not a heavenly state, but it's certainly what we learn from in this realm, because this is what what we, this is, this is the very stuff that we can be mindful of. We can't be mindful of heaven or deva realms or brahma realms or anything like that. We, we're mindful of the way it is now as, as we're sitting here breathing in this, in this body in whatever condition uh, it might be at this moment. And this mind, this, you know, this the emotions, the feelings, the attitudes, the mood that one is experiencing uh, right now. This we can, this is what we learn from, from the way it is. And so this mindfulness is, brings us out of, you know, is the, is the way out of the a world, a realm of suffering, even though, you know, like, you know, the, the body still gets old, like the Buddha in the scriptures, you know, he, after his enlightenment he got old and had illnesses and, and, you know, had to live with people trying to threaten his life, um, trying to blame him for things he never did, trap him, blame him, you know, he, I mean, the suffering of my life as a Buddhist monk, even at its worst, I've never had anything as bad happen to me as the Buddha in the scriptures. Nobody's ever tried to kill me yet. Or have I encountered a drachman elephant attack? <laughs> so... I mean, that's comforting, isn't it? You know, I guess you can, when, when you're caught in the middle of a, you know, uh, being blamed or criticized and, and uh, in various ways, uh, you know, then you, you know, that's not fair happening to me. And then you think, well, read the scripture, you know, look what happened to the Buddha. You know, that happened, you know, to the Buddha, you know. Nothing that bad has happened yet. Might not in the future, but but the important thing is not to wait for the for the drunken elephants or the murderers, but to deal with the the, the nitty gritty of daily life, the little stuff, you know, the the irritating, uh, aggravating stuff of existence as we experience it in daily life. Learn from from this because this is most of my life is going to be like this. It's not going to be the big experiences, the, the, the extreme events, but just this sitting, standing, walking, lying down, breathing, uh, living in society and, and being human, having a, a body that, that is very sensitive and gets illnesses, gets old. We all have to experience loss of loved ones, you know, you, you have to deal with grief and loss and disappointment and despair, these are a part of the human uh, condition. And all this is for developing the path. You know, none of this, none of these conditions are obstructive. 
because all conditioned phenomena then is, is seen in terms of what it is. So even, you know, despair and disappointment, resentment, indignation, anxiety, worry, confusion, uh, sexual desires, uh, praise and blame and all the rest, these are not, these don't obstruct the path. The only, you know, but ignorance is the, is the cause. Desire then, <clears throat> this is a desire realm, but, you know, when one awakens, so this sense of awakened attention is then that vicha is gone. With mindfulness, in a mindful moment, there's no vicha. You know, so mindfulness isn't a, that is not a position one takes with holding on to a view about Dhamma or, or anything at all, but it, it's this ability we have to be fully present in, <clears throat> and fully present and aware in the, in, at this moment, here and now. And then there's no avicca. But then it's, if we operate from avicca, then it's like, I have to be mindful. Then, then I start creating myself, and I grasp the idea of mindfulness, and thinking I have to, I have to become more mindful, then the, the vicha starts. So this is where it's a, a kind of investigation, you know, like the only so manasikara, getting to the very root, you know, the, the basis of it all, before, uh, you know, where we can actually catch things as they arise, begin to observe, you know, the arising of feelings or or after feelings have arisen, you know, maybe, uh, you know, the emotions can move so fast that you, you find yourself very angry all of a sudden. And then, you know, then you feel really outraged or completely angry in the present moment. But then just being aware of that, you know, using it as an object for reflection. So at that moment, when there's awareness of anger, that is not the vicha influencing anger anymore. Anger is, is, is recognized, it's seen, and it is not, you know, dismissed, not denied, not uh, exaggerated, but no. And that which is aware of anger is not anger. That which is aware of greed is non-greed. And that which is aware of delusion is non-delusion. So you have like lopa, dosa, moha, greed, hatred, and delusion, and you have alopa, adosa, amoha. So mindfulness is the, is the way, is, is the only escape we have from lopa, dosa, moha. Not through uh, running from them and, and uh, pushing them or resisting, but in letting go of them, seeing them with knowing, with mindfulness, rather than operating from a vicha, which is the cause of suffering. Also, this realm is a desire realm, so don't expect desires to stop or never experience them, but you know them, there's a knowing, you know, and, and this uh, so desire is no longer something you're getting rid of or making any problem about. You just know what it is. If you know what it is, it's not a problem. It's not a, an abstraction. So there's desire and non-desire. That which is aware of desire is non-desire. Okay, so then you, you can get this awareness of desire isn't desire. So, non-desire, non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion, non-suffering, no-self, non-attachment, these are the, this is mindfulness. This is the, the only possibility, when you, when you really get to understand it, the only possible way we can deal with it, because this realm that we're experiencing is so 
you know, it's, it's so powerful, so real for us. Having a physical body is, you know, it's from, from birth to death is unrelenting sensory feeling, you know, ongoing impingement on the, on the body and senses, the mind, and it, it, it's relentless. And how do you get out of it? Not to, you know, suicide? Is that, I don't know if that is what, but that's not recommended, the way, <laughs> because one would commit suicide out of the vicha. You know, I can't stand life anymore, I'm going to cut my throat. So that, that doesn't sound like the, the escape from it. It's just, you know, who knows what happens when you kill yourself. But I'm not about to do that to find out. It's much better the way the Buddha advised, <laughs> is to awaken and be mindful. Now in the, in the Paticca Samuppada, then you know, you notice that, uh, what is it, Batiloma Anuloma, you got the Avicca is the beginning of Avicca Bhaja Sankara Sankara Bhaja Vinyana. Well just take that, you know, if, if we, whatever we do, whatever I'm Avicca, it affects consciousness. You know, so we're, you know, that's why it's, it's uh, very important to, to see that, to, that just operating, being a monk uh, with a vicha as your kind of, you know, foundation for living this life is going to, you know, if you, you, you've got the tools, you've got everything around you, but you still have a, you know, you're still operating from a vicha which affects, you know, monastic life which will always make it into some form of suffering. Dukkha is a result. And so you, you follow that sequence of Icha Bhajya Sangha Sangha Bhajya Vijnana, then it goes into the more particular Vijnana, Bhajya Nama Rupa, then Salayatana, then uh, Pasta or Contact, then Vedana, Dana Upada. And then that ubadan, or attachment to desire, dana ubadan, takes us to uh, becoming rebirth and suffering. Toka parite vatuka tomanasa upayasa. Then the other one, where the Naroda side, is where the avicca is no longer operative. So you say Naroda. Sankarni Rodo, Sankarni Roda, Vinyana Nirodo, Vinyana Nirodha. So so this Nirodha is cessation. And that comes through mindfulness. Wherever you know if you you know, if you're lost in in some emotion, that point that you're actually aware of it, you suddenly realize oh, I'm really angry. You know, and then suddenly you're aware, you're not just getting lost in it or resisting it, you're suddenly... Then that, that is, you know, if you trust that moment, recognize the power of that moment, then you, 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 you know, you can actually uh, not create anything more around it. So it's that kind of neurota moment. The thing will, you know, as you recognize anger is like this, you still, you know, anger has a powerful kind of vibration or energy to it, so you stop thinking, the thinking process, but you still have this kind of angry energy, and this is where it takes patience to bear with that energetic, uh, lingering, uh, lingering energy till it ceases. It, drops away. That's Nirodha. So this uh, Patita Samuppada, you know, I've really used that in my monastic life as a meditation. As if, you know, this is 
considered one of the um, essential teachings uh, and what the Buddha was, was contemplating uh, is enlightenment. So I thought, you know, it, you know, it always sounded so complicated when you read it. I remember reading it for the first time. And I can't get my mind around that one. <laughs> And, and then the Naroda saw it sounded like annihilation. Consciousness ceases. When consciousness is ceased, it means you're dead. And then, at least that's. <laughs> so is it? Is it? You know, these uh, taking it too literally in a, you know, from a Western mindset is, is, is you can get it wrong. But. To say with with a bija, you know, visha ceases, then the, then there's no problem. It's just the way things are. But then we we lose it. We get caught up in our vipanka kama, get carried away with with an emotion. But there's always that moment where we recognize it. You know. So no matter how many hours you're lost in anger or resentment or whatever. There's a, you catch yourself, you begin to observe it. And then you, and then you kind of look at it, and you're not, not trying to do anything with it, or figure out how to get rid of it, or to blame yourself for not being mindful enough. You just stop there and patiently bear with the lingering uh, results of that emotion is like this, and it'll, if uh, with this patient mindfulness, then you'll actually know the cessation of it, the end of anger, is here. And not anger then, when the, when the anger does has cease, then there's not anger, it's like this. So you're you're, you're recognizing non-anger. You're discerning it. Then it's a wisdom level, you know, of discerning non-anger. You know the difference between anger and non-anger. Not through definitions of the words, but through the, act, the reality of those kind of, that, that energy that we call anger and its absence. So this is, uh, I think this is the most marvelous teaching in the whole world, the Buddhist teaching, not mine, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because it, 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 it amazes me, you know, the results of it, because it, it, it does work. It's not just kind of philosophy or theory or anything like that. It's, it is extremely practical and quite precise, uh, and uh, and it's within the possible, within our human potential. You know, this, this is why we're here as speakers, as monks, as monastics, because this is this is this is fulfilling. This is like the ultimate in in human. Reality in that we have this potential, this possibility to see in this very direct way, and and to see in this way is humbling. It's not. It doesn't. You know, it leaves you with nothing to hold on to. So you can't say, "Oh, I'm you know really you know I'm a fantastic meditator," or "I you know I'm you know when we start attaining states, then we become." fantastic people. But this way, if that you become, you don't become, you be, you, you're letting go of becoming, so what's left is nothing. But, awareness, and that awareness then is, is enough. I mean, after that there's nothing, you know, the, the desire to attain or achieve is no longer operating. Doesn't is not an attractive option anymore. The idea of attaining and achieving and becoming something. 
you, you realize the futility of following those kind of desires. So like when, you know, people, like Ajahn Chah, you know, people ask me, you know, about him. Well, you know, I, I write up early on, you know, before I really could understand his uh, data laws. Um, you know, he began to notice when he, you know, whenever he started giving a talk, you know, he'd sit up in a high seat and come on, and then he'd go in, you know, like totally empty. He, he, his face, if you looked at his face and his eyes, it's like nobody's there, nothing's there. It's rather eerie in a way. You know, like when Potra was quite a charismatic personality, so he could be brilliant and kind of charming. And he's sitting up there in the Tamar, and there's an empty, vacant, almost corpse sitting there. And out of that would come his desanas, his talks, from emptiness. So they were, they were, you know, really not, they weren't just Lumpur Cha's view about Dhamma practice or view of Buddhism. It, it actually, you know, the power of Lumpur Cha was that Actually, what he said was coming out of nothing. It wasn't a memorized, planned talk on uh, having studied the scriptures. It was it was coming straight out of nothingness or emptiness, and it was mesmerizing. You know, people. That's why you know he was so highly regarded because he wasn't just a, a clever. Man, you know, who understood Pali scriptures, but it was coming from, uh, you know, insight into reality. So even when I couldn't understand, you know, the words and that, I didn't feel the effect, you know, there's something there that I couldn't explain or at the time, you know, didn't really understand myself because I never just experienced that before. But I did, you know, I did why does it look like, you know, empty, nobody there, almost like a corpse. And then suddenly it would flow from there. And, and what he said always had a power to it. It was a skillful use of words uh, that wasn't just a, a display of his own intelligence but coming from from inside. So I offer this as a reflection. <laughs>